When it comes to Genesis 1, Christians tend to divide into two major camps, Old Earth and Young Earth creationists. The former sees the days as long periods of time, for example, Hugh Ross, while the latter insists on literal 24-hour periods, like Ken Ham. Professor John Walton of Wheaton College advocates for a different reading of the Bible's first chapter. By carefully comparing Genesis to other ancient Near Eastern creation texts, he proposes that it's talking about God providing functionality to the already existing cosmos rather than creating structures themselves. See what you think. Here now is podcast 152, Why Didn't God Call the Light Light, with John Walton. Genesis 1, of course, is a text that's just filled with controversy and misunderstanding. And that controversy and misunderstanding exist because of the way that our contemporary culture leads us to think about the world, about the Bible, and about God. You see, first of all, we've learned to talk about the natural world when it isn't. There's nothing about the world that is natural. And in the Bible, in the ancient worldview and the Israelite worldview, the world is supernatural. The natural supernatural distinction is a modern dichotomy and one that did not exist in the ancient world. And if we try to read the Bible through that natural supernatural dichotomy, we're going to run into trouble. Our world likes to talk about God intervening. God can't intervene. He's in it. He's doing everything. That would be like saying that I'm going to intervene in this sermon. I'm doing it. We talk about the miraculous as if God is doing things sometimes, but he's not doing things other times. God is always doing things. This world is supernatural. Anything that looks natural is only because it's supernatural in regular patterns. So the idea that we live in a natural world, sometimes graced with the supernatural, is a modern dichotomy. A second part of the problem is that we're used to taking the Bible on our own terms instead of on its terms. We read the Bible as if it was written to us. But it wasn't. It was written to Israel, for us, and for everyone. It's for us, but it's not to us. And if we try to take it on our own terms, as if it was written to us, in our language, in our culture, we're going to miss some important things. This is a modern indulgence to treat the Bible that way. It's a modern presumption, perhaps a modern arrogance. Thirdly, our culture has taught us to think that God is distant. We believe that God works in our lives, that God works in this world, that God drives history. Those are theological statements that we would agree with. But there's still some extent to which we've sort of banished him to the outside. And we see God as distant when we talk about this world around us and his role in it. That's our modern heresy. Our culture then has led us to a modern dichotomy when we think about the world, to a modern indulgence when we think about scripture, and to a modern heresy when we think about God. And these are things that we must seek to rectify. And we want to do that today as we look at Genesis chapter 1. First of all, we must see the world the way that the text sees the world. We must be able to look at the text through its own eyes and to accept that picture. Remember that when the Bible is communicating, it's communicating a worldview that when we submit ourselves to the text, we commit to embracing that view. And so we have to start to see the world the way the text sees the world. Then secondly, we must begin to see the text the way the Israelites saw the text. 
Again, it was written to them. The fact that it was written in a foreign language, Hebrew, demands that it was also written to a foreign culture because language and culture are inseparable. And therefore, the text is not embracing all cultures in the way that it communicates. It's written to them. And we shouldn't expect it to address our culture and our time in the same way. Certainly, again, it is for us, but it is not to us. So we have to make some adjustments. It's like we're sitting on the outside and and watching this communication between God and the people of Israel. And we have to find ways to get inside that circle. And the more we can do that, the more we can understand the text on its own terms. We want to take the Bible seriously. We need to take the Bible seriously. But sometimes we don't know quite how to do that. Because it's hard to break into that circle, especially when you're dealing with the Old Testament. And so today I hope we can get a fresh glimpse of some of the ways to do that so that we can start understanding the Bible on its own terms. When we get to Genesis 1, we find a story about creation. Duh. I mean, that sounds like a simple enough statement. But already, that's filled with the possibility of misunderstanding. To create something means to bring it into existence. So, if we're going to understand what it means to create something, we need to agree on what it means to exist. They say, oh, here's the professor part. He's getting philosophical on us. Stick with me, okay? We have to know what it means to exist. Now, for, for most of us, we don't even think about that, unless you happen to study philosophy and think about those things or enjoy reading philosophy. You don't even ask that question. We know intrinsically what it means to exist. Something exists when I can touch it, see it, hear it, bump into it, knock it over, trip on it. It exists. And that's intriguing because what it demonstrates is that our modern ontology, how we understand existence, is very physical, material. Things exist because they have a material structure. We normally, naturally think that way and don't even question it. So when we talk about creation, we're talking about God then bringing things into existence, which means he manufactures physical things. Now, I don't deny that God does that. Everything that is physically exists because God made it. But we're not asking that question. We're asking the question, what is it that the biblical text is telling us in Genesis chapter 1? What story is being told here? What part of that? And to do that, we have to say, how did they think about existence in the ancient world? What did existence mean to them? Because it's not the same. To them, for something to exist was not the same thing as for us. And therefore, to create is not the same thing as for us. In the ancient world, and I don't have time to demonstrate this this morning, I just have to say it. The demonstration is there, it's, you know, it's available. In the ancient world and in the Bible, something exists when it functions, when it works, when it's part of an orderly system, when it has a role to play. Both the ancient Near Eastern literature and the Bible describe this in terms of giving a name separating it out from other things, naming the function, the role that it will play. And of course, we see that throughout Genesis 1, as God gives names, as God separates things from one another. The Greeks persuaded people 
that the material structure of the cosmos was discernible. Before that, it wasn't. The ancient Egyptians, the ancient Mesopotamians, Canaanites, Israelites, the physical world was not discernible. They could not penetrate it. The Greeks persuaded us that it was. The Enlightenment persuaded people that the material structure of the cosmos was most important. And the post-Darwin era persuaded people that the material structure was all there was to the cosmos. And step by step, the church has followed. The church has agreed to think in the same terms. We agreed with the Greeks that it was discernible. And we reveled in it because Christians took the forefront eventually in trying to understand this world that God has made. That it was most important was another step. And yet, in a sense, we bought it. We said, yeah, that that kind of is the central focus of our understanding our world. And as the post-Darwin era dawned on us, we resisted. We said, no, that's not all there is. But yet in many of the ways that we act and think, we act as if it were, even though our theology is still sort of in place there in the background. And so we have to struggle with our own modern worldview and try to set it aside so that we can try to think about the Bible in its own terms, to think in terms of functions instead of structures. Now, function is an interesting concept. In our modern worldview, we think about function, certainly. But typically, in our way of thinking, function is a consequence of structure. That is, things work the way they do because of the physical properties they have. And that's what causes them to function. And so you get this close, tight relationship between function and structure. That's our modern worldview. The ancient worldview saw function differently. For them, function is a consequence of purpose. Ah, now there's a difference and an important one. In the ancient worldview, in the biblical worldview, things function the way they do because God is working with purpose. And that's what causes things to function. God is the one who set it up to work. God is the one who sustains that operation, not just day by day, but moment by moment. And God's role is to set up those functions and to maintain them. That's the most important thing that can be said about God's role in our world. It works because he set it up to work and he's behind its operations. If God were to unplug himself from our world, It's not that we would somehow then become less loving or that we would have more wars or disease or that somehow we would lose knowledge of him. If God unplugged himself, we would cease to exist along with everything else around us. God sustains his creation. Creation then, in the functional sense, is something that goes on and on and on. It's funny, the Egyptians even thought of that. They saw creation taking place anew every morning as the sun rose. We don't have to think in those terms. But the idea that creation, setting up those functions for the first time, is sustained and extended throughout history as the world continues to function under the grace of God is an important aspect of theology that we've lost. So we need to try to rectify these distortions. And I want to take you through Genesis 1 with a functional eye and let you see the differences that that makes in our reading the text, our understanding God's word. And so I suppose we should start with the title of today's sermon, (laughs) finally now, 15 minutes in. (laughs) The title of today, Why Didn't God Call the Light light. I mean, it would seem obvious, wouldn't it? Why does it have to tell you that God called the light something and then call it something else? Didn't that ever strike you? It probably didn't. And I taught Genesis for decades and it never struck me. But once you ask the question, it's kind of a nagging one. 
And that's because he's not naming a thing. We think of light as a thing. We think of light as physicists think of light. Even if you never had physics or didn't like physics or weren't good at physics, we still have adopted the idea light is a thing. And so when we talk about God creating light, we think about him manufacturing the thing that we call light. Israelites didn't think of light as a thing. And God didn't call the light light, naming a thing. So what's going on? Verse 5. We have to start in 5 and we'll work backwards. This is Hebrew after all. Okay. (laughs) God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the first day. Okay, now if you were thinking things and you somehow managed to to escape God called the light day unscathed, you would still run into trouble as a physicist on the second part. God called the darkness night because nobody thinks that darkness is a thing. It's the absence of a thing. We won't get into that. Okay, so what's going on here? This verse is not talking about the naming of things. So what is it talking about? We can tell by what it says. God called the light day. Okay? So if light is not a thing, what is it? What is it that he's naming day that has anything to do with the word light? You could all come up with it easily enough. God called the period of light day. Of course he did. That's a logical thing. God called the period of light day. And the period of darkness he called night. Language works that way. It's okay. It's all right. Now we breathe our sigh of relief and we back up to verse 4. God saw the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. Now again, physicists, the physicist in us would have a little trouble here. You can't separate those things. They are never together and that's a problem. But of course we're not talking about things here. Well, we take the lesson we learned in verse 5 and we apply it to verse 4. God called the period of light Day. We got that already. God separated the period of light from the period of darkness. Oh, okay, that makes sense. He set up periods for each one of them. Okay, that's just right. Okay, we're good. God separated period of day, period, uh, period of light, period of dark, day and night. You with me so far? Then I've got you. Verse 3. God said, let there be light. What must that mean? God said, let there be a period of light. That, my friends, is a far different statement than how we usually read that. Because now God is not calling a thing, physicist light, into existence necessarily. That's not the point. But God said, let there be a period of light. And he separated that period of light from a period of darkness. And he called the period of light day and the period of darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning day one. What then did God create on day one? Our conclusion must be that on day one, God created the basis of time. God created time on day one. It's not about light. It's about time. And that's the first step in bringing order to the cosmos. And I don't think that any of us would disagree that it's probably the most important foundational function of the cosmos, time. Our lives are ordered by it dictated by it, driven by it. God set it up. That's how the world works. That's how he made it to work. Now, if we back up to verse 2, we're still moving backwards. Demonstrates what we've been talking about. The earth was formless and empty. Those two words in Hebrew speak of non-functionality, non-purposefulness. Uh, <laughs> The fact that there was, this is what non-existence is for Israel in the ancient world. 
Even Egyptian texts talk about the non-existent, by which they refer to not, who knows what. They, they, don't re, they refer to the wilderness as non-existent. The desert reaches. They're non-existent, not because they don't exist physically, materially, but because they're non-functional. And what we have described here, proof of the fact that the text is not talking about physical structures, we have a description of a non-functional world. Formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep. See, there's material stuff there, the deep, but it's non-functional. The text, therefore, is not trying to describe how things came into being, but how functions came into being. That's their ontology, and that's far more important in their way of thinking. Things are immaterial. Okay, <laughs> Doesn't, they, don't, they don't matter. <laughs> that was a little, yeah, play on words. Okay, <laughs> the chuckles are far too late. Now, come on, <laughs> stick with me here. You got choice, dry or corny. I mean, it's the only two modes I come in. Okay. <laughs> we have to go back to verse 1. What does it mean then when it says, in the beginning God created heaven and earth? Heaven and earth is the cosmos, okay? We got that picture. In the beginning, I can't take time to explore it, but in the beginning talks not just about a point in time. Always in the Bible it talks about an, an initial period. So this beginning that it speaks of, this initial period, is the seven days. Okay, and in that way, verse 1 is an introduction to this chapter. In this beginning period of seven days, God created the cosmos. Now, we're back to that critical word, create, and we have to talk about it a bit. The Hebrew word is bara, and we need to explore it a little bit so that we can understand it. Words mean what they mean because of how people use them. And so if we're going to understand bara, we have to look at how it is used in the biblical text by the people who understood the word. Now, we all know that about language. We use words to communicate to one another because they have certain meaning based on the way we use them. Even Christians use certain words differently with each other because they have certain meanings to them. In families, some words have special meaning and they, they use it among themselves because they each know what the meaning of that is. Teenagers have words that they know what the meaning is that none of the rest of us understand. And if we once think we've got it and start using it, they won't use it anymore. But they, the idea is that, that there are words that have an agreed upon meaning. And if you want to know what the meaning is, you have to see how it is used. We do Bible the same way. Okay? There's no word from Moses that has a dictionary that tells it all the meanings he had. We have to figure it out from the text. So for a word like bara, we have to look through the Old Testament and find out how it's used. Well, we first of all find out that there are about 50 occurrences. That's not a huge amount, but it's enough to work with. About 50 occurrences, and we can start observing its usage. Okay, our first observation is that for the subject, that is, who does this kind of bara activity? It's only God. God is the only subject the verb ever has, and so we understand that this is a divine activity. That's good enough, and most of the commentaries have that piece of information. But there's another critical piece of information that very few of them talk about. And that is, what is the object of this verb? Okay, so God is always doing the baraing, and what is it that he is baraing? That's a weird mixture of Hebrew and English, but I'll live with it. Okay, so what's the object of those verbs? You'll be amazed to find out that it is not physical things. The things that God baraz typically are things such as people groups. God baraz them. God baraz Jerusalem. And that doesn't mean that he created the stone and built this. You know, there's, there's something else going on. God baraz phenomena like wind or fire or destruction or calamity, darkness. Those are not physical things. God baraz abstractions, righteousness, purity, praise. And when it actually does have an object that potentially could be material or structural, God baraz people, ah, gotcha. 
read the text. God barrages them, male and female functions. Bara speaks of assigning functions, establishing roles. That's how God creates. He brings things into existence by giving them a role and a function and putting them in the order of his cosmos, making them operate. That is the creative activity. Now, it's interesting if you think about it, and of course this is not determinative, but think about in English how you would use the word create. Think of the objects we would put with it. One could create a curriculum. You could create a committee. You could create a masterpiece. You could create havoc. Here we are talking about teenagers again. Um, you, you could create all kinds of hmm, functions. When the Bible talks about this act of bara. It's talking about God setting up functions. Our conclusion then, Genesis 1, the text asserts that in the seven-day initial period, God brought the cosmos into operation by assigning roles and functions. That's a really very long expanded paraphrase of verse 1. That's what he was about. That was his creative work. In that sense, the text has no interest in the physical, material cosmos. It's just not what it's talking about. Again, that doesn't mean that God didn't also create the physical, material cosmos. But that's not their wavelength. Again, that gets back to us wanting the text on our terms. We want to know about the physical cosmos because that's our ontology, that's our world, that's our concepts. And that's what we want to know about. We can't indulge ourselves. Again, no question that God did those things, but that's not what this text is about. God makes it work. Now, We've only talked about day one and the, the lead up to it. The first function that he gives us then in Genesis 1 is the function of time. Day two. Day two, God sets up an expanse. That's what NIV does with it in verse 6. It's a tough word to translate, the Hebrew rakia, um, because there's nothing really that fits very well. The Israelites, like all the peoples of their time, believed that there was something fairly solid up there holding up waters that were up there. They knew waters had to be up there because they come down. Again, they can't penetrate or discern the physical cosmos. Okay, so they figure there must be something solid up there, and that's what they use the word rakia for. That's what it meant to them, holding up the waters up there, and the text describes it that way. If you think that the text is giving us a description of God's creation of the physical, structural, material cosmos, You've got problems here in day two. Because the astronauts didn't bump into anything when they flew up in their rocket ships. And if you think that the Bible is talking about the structure of our cosmos, suddenly there's trouble. NIV fudges a little bit with expanse. Good try. Doesn't work. (laughs) But once we understand that the text is talking about functions... We can allow it to talk in the structural terms of the ancient world. And that's okay. God never, not once in the pages of scripture, not once does he change their view of science, their science, their world. Let me give you an example. When you read in the Bible something about keeping law with all your heart and mind and strength, that word mind, translators are doing what they can with it, but actually the word is your innards, your gut. Because in the ancient world, they believed that that's what people thought with. Heart, liver, kidneys, intestines. You thought with the stuff down here. There's not even a biblical Hebrew word for brain. They didn't know what that did. God does not say, 
This is a blood pump. This is what you think with. Let's get it straight. God does not reveal that information. In fact, he seems quite content for him to talk to them about thinking with their hearts or their guts or their innards. And that doesn't damage his reputation. Somehow taint the truth of his word. He communicated to them in their terms. He didn't need to change their science. So when he gets to day two, he's not talking about the physical structures. He just uses the terms that are familiar to them. Something semi-solid or solid, stretched out, holding up waters up there. He uses the description of their system because he's talking about a function. What function is it? It's weather. God created the systems by which weather works. And he can talk to them about the rakia. That's all right. We don't have to fly up there and get a piece of it for that to be okay. We talk in terms of high-pressure systems and low-pressure systems. That's all right, too. Okay, but that's our way of talking about it. Day two, God created weather. And he described that in terms that his audience will understand. God is a God who communicates. Day three seems a little odd to us sometimes because it looks like he's creating two things. When you think of material structures, it looks like two things. The sea and the dry land on the one hand and the vegetation, uh, you know, seeds, bearing seeds. All. It looks like two things. Well, it's not. Once you understand the function behind it. The idea, certainly, that plants bear seeds that grow other plants of the same sort, that's important. That's how... We get food. That's how the system works. For agriculture, irrigation, you need water, you need dry land, soil, you need the principle that things will grow from other things. And so God set that system up. Day three, God created vegetation. The principles. Now those are the three main functions. Time, weather, food. These are the three main functions that dominate our world. I'll pretty much guarantee it that when you sit at the bus stop or the supermarket or on the train or whatever it is and talk to somebody next to you, you don't usually talk about molecules or quarks or, or you know, the, those, you talk about time, weather, and food. Because those are the functions that dominate our lives. And no matter what culture you're in, what time period, what part of the world... Time, weather, and food are going to be the principal issues. And Genesis 1 has something important to say. God set it up to work that way. And God's the one who makes it work. So, in the first three days, we have the three central functions of our world that the text tells us God did. In days 4, 5, and 6, we're not going to go through them, but you can see the functional element. Sun, moon, and stars... Somehow now we're not flaming balls of gas or bits of rock. Well, that's not their function. Their function is signs, seasons, days, and years. All functions, all related to people. These are the functionaries that serve in God's purpose for carrying out the functions. And you get birds and fish. They operate in the, the sphere of uh, day two. You get... Animals and people, they operate in the sphere set up in day three. Functionaries operating in spheres of certain functions. Now, there's still an important part of Genesis we need to, to hit, and we need to do it quickly. <laughs> what about the seven days? How's that come into all of this? Good question, and not hard to answer. The key is on day seven, God rests. You know, we've sometimes probably thought of that as almost an appendix. Okay, It's like the credits at the end. We got to the main thing. The thing has come to its conclusion, the grand climax. People were created. And now, oh yeah, God rests. Any Israelite, any Babylonian, any Egyptian, any Canaanite, any Moabite reading this text would read God rests, and they would say immediately in the word association game, which they played all the time. No. Um, and they would say, temple because 
That's what temples were for, for God to rest in them. That is why they built temples. Now, why are God's resting in temples? Well, it's because resting is not an act of disengagement like we often think about it. When the gods rested, that meant they could rest because everything was secure. Everything was set up. Everything was ready to go. That's like taking your seat at the helm, at the controls, ready to run. When God tells the Israelites he's going to give them rest from their enemies on every side, the idea is security. Everything's as it ought to be. And when God rests on the seventh day, that means order has been established. The functional cosmos is ready to roll. And the reason temples were so important to people in the ancient world was because God sat in his temple, and from there he ran the world. This is the Oval Office, folks. This is where it happens. Decisions are made. Actions carried out. God is in his temple, and all is right in the world. God's rest is an act of ownership and control, authority. Now, what does that have to do with the seven days? Once we understand that we're dealing with a temple picture here, this is God's cosmic temple that he has been creating, a cosmic temple that operates, that works. Temples in the ancient world were dedicated to, a process of dedication. They go through all building everything, building the structure, building the furniture, weaving the priests, everything ready. And then there'd be a dedication of that temple that lasted seven days. A seven-day dedication of the temple. During those seven days, and we have the text to demonstrate this, even biblical text, during those seven days, you would first of all proclaim the functions of this temple. This is what it's going to do. This is how it serves. This is how it works. You proclaim the functions. Then you install the functionaries, priests, furniture, everything getting ready. Functions, functionaries, seven days, dedication of temple. And then at the end of that seven-day dedication, that which represented the deity, whether it's the Ark of the Covenant or an image in the ancient Near East, would be brought in in grand procession and take up its rest in the temple. Point. This cosmos is God's temple. He built this temple this cosmic temple, and made it functional with people as his priests, with all of its functions and functionaries, set in operation by his hand, sustained by his hand, as he sits in the control room in his rest, running this world. This is the truth of Genesis 1. This is the point to be made. And yet we speak of the natural world and banish him to the far reaches of the cosmos. This should change our understanding of the world, of how we think about it, about how it came to be. Once these seven days are seen as days dealing with functions, the whole controversy about the age of the earth gets put where it belongs. This text doesn't say anything about the age of the material, physical things, because it's not about the making of those. Again, no doubt that God did them, but that's not this story. It changes our view of God as we think about his creation as a living, happening thing. And we come to understand God as active in every part of our lives, day to day, moment by moment, sustaining his creation. And desiring to be in residence among us because his presence and relationship with him is what it was all about to begin with. God didn't create because he needed us or because he was lonely or even just because he could. He created, created us to be in relationship with him. And so he created this place where his presence could be and we could come into his presence and be in relationship with him. 
That's how we need to think about our world and how great our God is. Interesting hypothesis, isn't it? Thanks to Dr. Walton for giving me permission to play out this lecture. And if you want more in-depth explanation of his perspective on Genesis 1, you can get his book, The Lost World of Genesis 1. And if you visit his faculty page, which I have a link to in the show notes, you can see what other books he's written as well. Uh, essentially, he does a lot of this historical and cultural context for the Old Testament. That's really his wheelhouse there.